From the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. I am at the Ohio Anna Book Festival 2011 in beautiful Columbus, Ohio, where it has just started raining. And uh, we are at the WCBE studios on the Fort Hayes campus talking to a number of authors. One of them is the man sitting next to me who wrote Jim Tully, American Writer, Irish Rover, and Hollywood Brawler, Mark DeWatt. Dwidziak. Okay, That's, now, now here's radio training. Just break it down phonetically and yeah. you'll have it. All those yeah. vowels actually work in your favor. I was looking at the wrong name when, yes. I, when you came on. Right. I, I yes. blew it completely right. there, but that's okay. We're on it's, video, you know? That's right. It's Dwidziak anyway, but, <laughs> but Mark works very well. So Mark so, is yes. here with us to correct all the errors that I'm going to make and tell me about Jim Tully, who uh, has, he's written a book in association with Paul Bauer. Yes, I did and not the, do this alone. The yeah. easy to pronounce. Paul Bauer. Bauer and, and his name gets wrong more than mine because people always takes the extra time to spell my name correctly. You know? Okay. So right. actually his name has been misspelled more than mine has. Okay. But Jim Tully, uh, lost American writer. To cut to the chase, this guy was a literary superstar of the 1920s and 30s. And there were a few who were bigger than he was. He was considered the equal of Sinclair Lewis, Eugene O'Neill, Willa Cather, F. Scott Fitzgerald. In fact, George G. Nathan put him in the, the same category with those writers as a major American voice. Mm -hmm. He wrote 14 books between 1922 and 1942. 14 books which basically focused on the American underclass, talking about boxers, hobos, carnival workers, prostitutes, railroad workers, Irish ditch diggers. He was writing about an America which didn't have a voice, the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Most everybody else during the Roaring Twenties was writing about the rich and the wealthy mm -hmm. and the glittering time of the Jazz Age. He was focusing on an America which America didn't really want to admit existed. Well, got in trouble for it. I mean, he his 1920-something book on prostitution the 30s. was banned. I think that's, that's Ladies in the Parlor. Right, that's, got that's, banned. Yeah, that's right. That's the mid-30s. And, mm -hmm. but, um, and, and he starts to go into eclipse. And today he's a forgotten writer. But there are so many interesting things about Tully that he's so ready to be rediscovered. For one thing, he is the lost, he's the missing link between Jack London and Jack Kerouac because he was a hobo. He spent six years on the road learning in America which did not exist. He was the real goods uh, from that standpoint. Uh, Ken Burns wrote the foreword to this biography mm -hmm. and a very eloquent passage in it. He says, you know, Jim Tully's writing about an America we suspected existed but didn't know existed, but we knew it had to be there. And mm -hmm. here he is providing it because it does not fit the American mythology. It doesn't fit in very neatly with the whitewashed version of America that we want to believe. Mm -hmm. This was a writer who was focusing on people who didn't have a voice. He was giving voice to people who were largely silent. Sure. So he is, his books are amazing. He came from absolute dirt poverty. He was from born in St. Mary's, Ohio, the son of an Irish ditch digger. At six, his mother died. He gets sent to a Catholic orphanage in Cincinnati. He spends six Dickensian years in this Catholic orphanage. And then he spends six years on the road. Not really as a hobo, but more as what was called a road kid. Um, not somebody who would, he would get off the road every once in a while, work for a carnival, work in a chain factory or something like that. But mostly he's traveling America and he is accumulating the raw material that's going to become his books later on. Mm -hmm. But he's still largely uneducated. The idea that this guy would become a writer, and not only a writer, but a household name in the 20s and 30s, he might as well said he wanted to go to Saturn than to, to, to set out for this. Well, he's got a perfect background when he's working. He's itinerant, but he's working in a chain factory. Yes. That is a beautiful metaphor. And in you know. fact, he, when he gets off the road in 1907, he gets off the road in Kent, Ohio, because Kent had a chain works and it was one of the places he could work. So he drops off a freight train in Kent, Ohio, and he walks up the chain, and then he starts a boxing career during this time. For the next few years, he's working his way up the featherweight ranks, and he's getting within a few fights of the title, really, mm -hmm. when he really decides he wants to be a writer, that he would much rather be a writer. He's, he's actually wooing the town librarian during this time, who turns him down. Finally, mm -hmm. he, he does propose, and she turns him down, but she gives him the main question of his life, which is, what good is it to whip the whole world and end up a bartender? And he thought about it and said, you're right, and he spent the next 10 years making himself into a writer. Mm -hmm. He ends up in Hollywood. He works a year and a half with Charlie Chaplin uh, and to support himself, but during this time, he is starting to publish, and by 1924, he is on his way. Okay. And, 
So what got you initially interested in this? Uh, have you followed Jim Tully for a while? How did you discover him? This book took us uh, all of 19 years to write. And I, and, I, and I did write other books in between. I, 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 I was one who slowed us down because I stopped to write other books. But um, I walked into, Paul is a bookseller. And his bookshop is, in of all places, Kent, Ohio. Even though it was in Kent, Ohio, Paul did not know who Jim Tully was. I walked into his bookstore about 19 years ago, almost to the, to the day, to today. And Paul said, have you ever heard of Jim Tully? And I said, no, should I have? And he said, I just had a customer ask about his boxing novel, The Bruiser. And I said, well, who was he? And Paul said, I don't know. I think Paul was a little chagrined. He was a bookseller, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He should know a, a writer from Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I left and went to another bookstore in Akron and found a copy of Shanty Irish, which is his book about his, his family. I took it home and found it for $2.50. I took it home and I read it in a day. And it just took the top of my head off. I had never read anything like this. Tully was sort of the, the, the founder of the hard-boiled school of writing. Uh, he's there, right there right around the same time as Dashiell Hammett. So his writing really hits you like a pile driver. He's got a real staccato style that just snaps out like the jab mm -hmm. of a boxer. But at the same time, there's this Irish lyricism. There's this, uh, the soul of this Irish poet. And his best writing, these two sides of him are in dynamic tension, this kind of hard, gritty realism that's being tempered by the most poetic language you've ever heard. And I couldn't believe that anybody could be so much in touch with both sides at the same time. And so I immediately started researching Tully, and so did Paul. When we got into our research, what we found out was that when Tully not only had Ohio connections, that when he dropped off the road, he did it in Kent. We didn't know that, obviously. He did it about three blocks away from where Paul and I had our first conversation about Jim Tully. Mm -hmm. He dropped out in front of the train station in Kent, which was literally a short walk from Paul's bookstore. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of serendipitous moments as we research this that have come up like that. Have you been able to find all of his books? I mean, a lot oh, of them yes. seem like they're out. Are they all out of print, but they're just available? We started collecting immediately by the end of the year. By the, that was 1992 when we started. And by the end of the year, we had found all 14 books. And we've been republishing them through the Kent State University Press. We've so far republished four of his books. Beggars of Life, which is about his six years he spent on the road as a hobo. Circus Parade, which was about his time with small-time circuses, real small time. This is not the greatest show on earth, and this is probably one of his grittiest books. All the circus associations wanted to ban this book. This really? Was, yeah. So it's sort of a, that's a Sinclair Lewis kind of meatpacking industry. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. This was this was a dark side of the American circus, yeah. and the you know the, the American character too, because the circus the American characters are reflected in the people he met in the circus. Mm -hmm. Then Shanty Irish, which is about his, and my personal favorite, it's the first one I read, and I think it's his, his most endearing book. And The Bruiser, which is his boxing novel. Those four have been republished through Kent State, and we hope to eventually republish them all. So is his stuff now, you can get the rights to it pretty reasonably, I take it? Or well, they're not reasonably. The, the, the family did not keep up with them, so he, they all lapsed into the public oh, domain. Okay. So we've republished the works with new forwards. John Sales, for instance, did the forward to Shanty Irish. And it's a beautiful forward. It's just a gorgeous piece of writing. And uh, Harvey, the late Harvey Picard, did the forward to Circus oh, really? Parade. Mm -hmm. So you know, we 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 we're winning. We won a lot of Tully converts along the way too. Okay. We introduce people. They have the same response that we have. And you will have if you pick up one of his books, you'll have the same. Words, How do I not know about this guy? Why do you think he did, fell out of uh, favor? Was it because he explored the the darker recesses, and as it went on, people didn't like that as much as, say, Fitzgerald, I think which is actually a, pretty dark. You know? Yeah, it is. I actually think that the, the, the real reason that Tully is not known today is bad timing. And I'm going to, let me explain that, is Tully goes, starts to go into eclipse in around 19, in 1942. In 1942, he suffers a massive heart attack. And this is the, really the beginning of the end. He lives another five years, but he's in very, very bad shape for the last five years. He suffers a heart attack. He suffers from a number of ailments, including crippling, crippling arthritis. The hard life that he led sort of started to break him down at the mm -hmm. end. So the last five years are not good years, and he's not writing very much. Almost all the writers of the 20s and 30s went into eclipse during World War II. 
without exception, almost every single one of them, the publishing industry sort of went put on hold. And then when it came back, the established writers were all blown away by this new breed of young writer like Norman Mailer and James Jones who were writing about their war experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were a writer who was well-known in the 20s and 30s, your way back was one of two ways. You either wrote yourself back to prominence the way that uh, Faulkner and Hemingway did, or you had a literary champion who celebrated your cause and carried you like Fitzgerald did. In Tully's case, he's not writing. He dies in 47, so he can't write himself back into prominence. And his literary champion is H.L. Mencken, who, who has, suffers a massive stroke in 48 and is unable to read or write for the next eight years of his life. Mm. So it's just, and you can see it happening. In the 50s, Tully's still pretty well known mm -hmm. in the 50s. His name comes up even in congressional hearings. You know, at one point during the Alger Hiss hearings, somebody referred to Whitaker Chambers, uh, the witness against Alger Hiss, as being a would-be Jim Tully. And everybody knew what, they meant, what he meant. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the 60s, Tully's gone. It's by interesting. By the 60s, he's out of print, yeah. and his work, he's forgotten. It's funny that H.L. Mencken would be a champion. This guy doesn't seem like a pair you'd put together. You know, because uh, Mencken They mention is, that. There's, there's, yeah. a, there's, a, uh, there's a letter from Mencken where he says that uh, uh, Tully is shanty Irish, you know, and, and I'm low-born Dutch, and we get along great. <laughs> you know, they certainly had a lot of things in, in common. Uh, w not one was in a low opinion of their fellow human beings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another was a, a great capacity for beer. Uh, they certainly, <laughs> the Tully won beer drinking contests in San Francisco and Baltimore. He apparently had just an amazing capacity just to open his mouth and swallow it down. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and yet somehow uh, he had health problems at the end of his life can after you all this describing. That doesn't even begin to throw in the boxing and those six hard years he spent on the road mm -hmm. and everything else. But he, but he didn't smoke. You know, of all oh. the vices he didn't pick well, up, good. <laughs> he didn't smoke. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Well, the book is Jim Tully, American writer, Irish rover, and Hollywood brawler. And it is now, it, it's also available from um, the Kent State Kent University, University Press. Press. This, is all, this, 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 this is an entire project. Uh, we're doing this with the Kent State University. One of the reasons we did was they agreed to do the reprints because it does no good to publish a biography of this guy and then people not be able to read his best work. Okay. So that was one of the reasons we went with Kent State. And... Uh, and, and I, I could regale you with Tully stories forever, but let me leave you with one, because okay. he was called in his time the most hated man in Hollywood and the most feared man in Hollywood. Mm. One of the two reasons for that. One was that when he got to Hollywood and he was writing his books, he started a dual career as the first journalist covering Hollywood, honestly. He was writing for Vanity Fair, Scribner's, the top magazines. And these pieces today look pretty mild, but by back then, when the studios were controlling all of the publicity, mm -hmm. they were harsh. And he wrote a piece about a matinee idol named John Gilbert, who's largely forgotten today, but John Gilbert was considered the heir to Rudolph Valentino. As the, uh, and he wrote a piece for Vanity Fair and John Gilbert, which was so harsh that Gilbert threw up when he read it. <laughs> and two years, he festered about it for two years. For two years, Gilbert fed, and finally, 1930, he enters a restaurant, the Brown Derby, and there's Jim Tully sitting across the, the, the room from him. So Gilbert goes for him. Gilbert says, get on your feet. Tully doesn't even know who's talking to him. He immediately, the old boxer instinct comes up and his body forms an S. He's in the fighter's crouch. Mm -hmm. Gilbert takes two swings at him, misses, and Tully throws a right over the second punch and knocks him cold with one punch. The next day, Newspapers across America, the editorial cartoonists, on the front page of the paper, there are cartoons of Tully knocking out John Gilbert. And Gilbert's falling backwards with little X's in his eyes, and the matinee <laughs> idol has been floored, knocked out with one punch. The police arrived on the scene, were called, and said to Tully, you know, what happened? And Tully said, well, I'm not sure. You know, this guy came at me wildly swinging his arms, and he was creating such a breeze, I thought he was going to give himself a cold, so I put him to sleep for his own protection. <laughs> Al, Louis B. Mayer hated John Gilbert. So within a couple of months, he rushed Jim Tully into John Gilbert's next film. Hmm. And it's the only film footage we have of Jim Tully. It's called Way for a Sailor. And John Gilbert, Jim Tully, and Wallace Beery play three sailors on leave. 
and it was released by MGM. It still shows up on Turner Classic Movies every once in a while. Mm -hmm. It's out there. But when we give Tully Talks, we show excerpts from this. So film. why did he put him in the film if he hated him? He wanted to show he was a bad actor, or well, because he, he wanted to humiliate Gilbert because he put oh, Tully. He, okay. He hated John Gilbert. Gilbert. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so he put Tully in the film to further humiliate. Awesome. Gilbert. <laughs> so, and surrounded with these two he-men who, you know, uh, sort of, so. What happened to Gilbert's career after that? Was it? Went very quickly down. The, <laughs> it was already going down the chutes. John Gilbert was one of those those people of, and there's you'll get some debate about this, about whether he made the transition from silent to, to talky films. Uh, the, the, the myth about Gilbert was that his voice was high-pitched, was that he had a squeaky voice, and it sounded funny coming from a leading man. Mm-hmm. You know, you see talkies with John Gilbert, and it's not really true. It really is a myth that got, got spread around. His voice wasn't that, that high or reedy. It didn't sound at all, you know, effeminate or anything like that. But it is true that the mold of the Hollywood leading man quickly became people like Gary Cooper who, you know, and Clark Gable who really were he-man type, right. and John Gilbert was more the suave. Yeah. And balance. Cooper hardly so, even spoke. Right. So, Didn't you know, what are you, yeah, yeah. yeah. you going to do? Yeah, but, yep. but you know, the, the really the mold of the, the Hollywood leading man changed mm -hmm. very, very quickly, and Gilbert would have probably fallen out of fashion regardless. All right. So. Well, I'm going to give it another try. Mark DeWitteback. DeWitziak. DeWitziak. There you go. See, you, you, it's just crazy. It's all right. I, I thank you very much. No, my pleasure. Thank you for being here on Writer's Talk and for talking to us about Jim Tully, American writer, Irish rover, Hollywood brawler. And from the Center for the Study and Teaching Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Doug Dangler. Keep writing. Mm -hmm.